Hi everybody, we're back. This is Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. This is theCUBE, Silicon Angle's continuous production of EMC World 2013. We're here in Las Vegas, day three, about 15,000 customers and partners, and it's really quite an event, it's probably the, the biggest and best EMC World that, that I've been to, and the largest to date. I'm here with Stu Miniman, my co-host for this segment. Greg Shearer is here. He's the Vice President of Storage and Strategy at Broadcom. Greg, welcome back to theCUBE. Thank you, it's good to be here. Yeah, so this is quite an event. Um, I think you guys, you, you have a presence here. You, you do. You just you know, came in and I think we're struck by the size of the show, as was I. I mean, I think the, you know, we were talking, the beginning days it was quite small. <laughs> you know, yes. a bunch of technical guys. And, and even recently, you know, five, six, seven, nine thousand people, but big explosion this year. Oh, it's tremendous. I mean, that, that coupled with holding it you know, during an overlap time with uh, NetWorld Interop down the street, it's, it, it's really quite a venue. I see a lot of, of faces that have gone back and forth between the shows. Yeah, well, Stu, you had some uh, folks on from, uh, from Interop and uh, yeah, cross pollination. Yeah, absolutely, Dave, and uh, we talked, there's uh, a lot of silo busting going on, mm. uh, and as, as software is taking over the world, um, you know, people need to understand those cross domains. I mean, if you look at a recent hire, EMC brought in John Rose uh, to be CTO because they specifically wanted somebody that wasn't storage. And, mm. and of course, John was uh, CTO at Nortel and Huawei, so uh, really knew the interop crowd uh, over there. And uh, you know, talking about all these changes as EMC shows transformation. Mm. Um, and uh, you know, Greg, you've been on the cube a couple of times. One of the things we've looked at is uh, we think server virtualization really kicked off this wave of change in infrastructure. Uh, ripple through storage, and it's also ripple, rippling through uh, networking. So, uh, you know, maybe can you talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing from that oh, intersection of storage and networking today? And uh, yeah, I'd love to. I mean, it, it, it's fascinating, Stu, because it, you know, if you look at it, the, the ripples are still going on in terms of, of how fast things are moving. Because you know, where, where we started out with just combining a bunch of servers, you know, onto one virtual platform. It really put stress on the networking, and you know, from an economic standpoint, people, you know, that was the first practical platform within the enterprise that decided that convergence between storage and networking was important. I mean, it was not because it was cool technology, but because it was the economics that, that sort of demanded it. As we move into 40 gig and, and more, uh, you know, more platforms that have, you look at the, the latest, you know, Romney-based Intel platforms with you know, multiple cores, you know, per socket, you know, that's only going to increase. These, you know, virtual servers are now capable of dozens moving to hundreds of, of, you know, virtual machines, and that's really pushing the envelope even further. If you look at a lot of the, the cloud-centric data centers, both uh, public and private cloud, that drives the need for virtual networking. So outside of just the virtual server market, you know, we need the ability to instantiate virtual networks. So you see in the media, a lot of times, the, the talk of, uh, NVGRE or VXLAN encapsulation or tunneling, we're, we're at the very beginning of that uh, in terms of even its use cases. Today if you want to migrate a VM from one server to another server, those servers have to exist within the same uh, subnet and VLAN today. Well, it's maybe practical on a very small scale, but if we're talking about global data centers where you have a data center in Norway and a data center in New York City, likelihood of them being on the same subnet or it's not likely, <laughs> it's impossible. So the, the whole notion of virtual networking is really encapsulation and extending that, that notion of, of uh, you know, the, the network layer to where now I can appear in any virtual network that I want to anywhere in the world and therefore migrate my workloads uh, accordingly. So, Craig, I wonder if we, if we could actually step back for a second and up level for a mm -hmm. second. We talk, you know, one of the big trends that that kind of dri driving of software and in many ways kind of the commoditization of hardware underneath. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the folks at, at EMC World, but you probably have heard of Broadcom, but might not know all the places you guys sit. Uh, you sit in the server, you sit in the switch. Um, if I go through the show floor, somebody that knows the components, it's like, oh, hey, you know, there's Juniper, there's Arista that's using your chipset. You mm -hmm. look on, uh, you know, all the servers that are going in there. Oh, I know where Broadcom sits in there. Can you give us kind of you know that that uh, you know high level quick overview of where Broadcom sits. You bet, I'd love to. So uh, Broadcom's actually organized into multiple different uh, business segments. The, the business segment that I work with in the data center and service provider we call ING or the infrastructure and networking group. And if literally if you go through a, a data center, um, it, it would be hard to find a component that doesn't or a, a, a box that doesn't have Broadcom somewhere inside. 
um, in the, the form of uh, network processors with our XLP line of, of network processors. Um, our FIs and CERTIs at the very low level in terms of being able to transmit um, data at, you know, across uh, copper at uh, long distance or short reach. Um, Ethernet controllers. So it, it, we have a, a presence here at the show where we're, uh, we're displaying our new line of, of cards, uh, Ethernet NICs, uh, both uh, specifically for, for Dell and HP servers, but we have a very broad line of, of uh, both uh, the chips themselves as well as boards. Um, in addition to the NICs though, we have a very, very big presence in the switching marketplace. Matter of fact, um, most uh, 10 gig switches, if you open them up, there's Broadcom silicon inside. Yeah, except for the guys that make their own chips, uh, like, you know, one of the big players in the market. Maybe them. <laughs> but if you look at the... At the but, but even they have used Broadcom chips in some of their switch, especially in the low latency market. They do, uh, specifically. And so, you know, the, the, the presence, uh, Broadcom really has a presence in, in many of those markets. Uh, I'd, I'd say virtually all of them. If you look under the covers, there's Broadcom Silicon. Uh, we like to, to really portray ourselves as really providing the foundation. I know SDN is a very overused term right now, but however you define SDN in terms of where software meets the hardware in terms of networking, Broadcom provides the foundation for that with you know, FIs and CERTES chips uh, at the physical layer to Ethernet controllers, Ethernet switches, um, and network processors to go ahead and, and uh, work in conjunction with those. Yeah, so, uh, you know, interesting point there. I, I know I l you look at how SDN might change the marketplace. If, uh, you know, market share shifts between the vendors, uh, if you go to commodity switches like coming out of Taiwan, even any of those pieces, you know, Broadcom's a winner. Yes, yes. Matter of fact, we, we really believe that in, in a lot of the world, if you look at, at the, the switching market in general, what, what's held people captive to specific vendors has really been their control plane software. Well, the, the very nature of you know, OpenFlow, OpenStack, SDN, is to take that control plane and commoditize it, push it out into the ecosystem to allow innovation to happen anywhere. I mean, there, there's many different avenues to this, and, and uh, we could probably talk multiple segments in, in uh, the, the whole network, uh, uh, NFV, you know. Network function virtualization. Ne ne thank you, all yeah. I could think of is fabric. Network function virtualization, and, and even the whole notion of, of putting things like Chef and Puppet, you know, that allow uh, all different forms of applications to run through APIs directly on commodity switches. Um, you know, they're, they're, these are sort of both attacking the same kind of marketplace, but they're, they're both looking at the same issue, and that's to really allow innovation into the, the switching ecosystem. Much like if you, if you look at the x86 compute server market, anybody can write any application they want within the, the context of a server. That's really the basis for you know, the operating system and the, the software development kits. That same paradigm is now moving into the network to be able to, to run your application where, where it makes the most sense. Um, especially for, for uh, visualization and statistics gathering and to be able to see what's happening in your network. We talk a lot on theCUBE about the hyperscale market and the things mm -hmm. that we can learn from the Googles and the pay Facebooks and the Amazons of the, of the world. We saw EMC this, this week announce their big Viper, software-defined storage. You're talking about software-defined networking, obviously, that, that's kind of been a, from a theme standpoint, but kind of a leader here, sort of mm -hmm. storage is sort of lagging in the whole software-defined space and it looks like it's going to change. But my question to you is specifically, what in your view is the industry generally and Broadcom specifically learning from the hyperscale space, what lessons are you learning and how are you applying them? Boy, it's a, it's a great question, because uh, you know, if you look at the hyperscale space, you know, with, within the context of the enterprise, we still talk about, boy, you know, storage and networking, when are they going to fully converge? In the hyperscale space, that question was answered <laughs> many years ago, <laughs> so the, the right. answer is, is, it's all ethernet. So storage is, e is ethernet, all your networking is ethernet, your lower latency is all ethernet, so convergence happened there very early on. The, the other thing that, that is fascinating is, is that within the, the context of the hyperscale environment, uh, virtualization, server virtualization, multi-tenancy is really what uh, was driven there on massive scale. So uh, the, the whole notion of, of um, uh, tunneling in the, the NVO type capability, network virtualization offload, that was really driven first within that hyperscale, just again because of their massive scale, where they're deploying tens of thousands of servers at a time, as opposed to 10, or one rack worth, or 20, or 30, 40, 50. 
and their, their scale is so large that they've developed problems that uh, really couldn't be solved any other way than you know, within the, the hyperscale, it's an all L3 network. You know, TCP is used exclusively from a, you know, ECMP and a routing standpoint between top of racks. We see more and more of that happening now, um, you know, being brought back into the enterprise data center just to, to simplify, you know, how things are done, to, to use fewer uh, amounts of folks to go ahead and manage, you know, the ecosystem, because that's sort of the, the large tenant of, of the hyperscale environment is you can't afford to do things the same way that, that uh, has been done traditionally in the enterprise. It has to be simple, push button, and very few personnel to oversee it. And that's being brought back in now. You know, innovation started in the hyperscale and is moving back into private cloud and the enterprise data centers. How long, so how, well, how long is that, what's that time frame? Is it five years, seven years, four years? And is, it, is, that, is the time it takes for hyperscale to seep into the enterprise compressing? Oh, I think it definitely is. And it, the reason it's compressing is, is because of the economics. You know, it used to be that, that you know, two decades ago, we, we did things because technology was cool and it was really you know, the innovation cycle that we could do interesting things. Uh, now we're really looking at it more from the standpoint that the enterprise data center is being driven to survive based on you know, the economics of, you know, I, I, need, I need 10 gig, I need 10 gig everywhere because I don't have time to physically create silos of servers that here's my one gig that feeds into 10 gig you know, uplinks that then feed into an ag layer that my tier one, tier two, and tier three of the data center. Now we're building flat data centers, but specifically driven because I can, I can go to a server and do a push button and, and completely reconfigure what are application servers, what are database servers, and what are my web tier front end and change that configuration at will as opposed to sending out a crew to recable the servers. And Stu, we're seeing so many disruptions here. We, we always talk about flash. If we remove that bottleneck, then the network becomes the bottleneck. We've been talking about open flow, open source, open stack. Yeah, D Dave, great point. And it, one of the challenges, you know, networking, and especially if you talk uh, kind of the economics, it's a complex and layered piece. If I look at the move from one gig to 10 gig, there's the server bus, there's the switch back plane, there's, you know, the cabling is one of the things that gets overlooked all the time, and mm. the cables and the optics are what cause so much of the cost and, and power. So, Greg, you know, I, I think 10 gig, you know, it's taken us over 10 years to really move <laughs> yes. uh, switches. Uh, servers, have we gotten over 50% of all servers shipping 10 gig yet? No, I, I, we, we haven't actually. So the, the percentage in the rack is still quite low actually. It's, wow. it's you know, on the order of 10% of, of rack wow. servers. Now, now this is in the enterprise data center. Okay. If we were to look at the public cloud or, or more the hyperscale environment, right. if you include China, which China's lagging the, the US, and the, I'll call it just the Far East, you know, we're definitely seeing in the U.S. it's a 50% penetration, you know, within the public cloud. China's a much smaller percentage. The overall rack, though, is probably sub 10%. Wow, because um, I know we had talked when Romley came out and it was, uh, you know, the <laughs> hope was that we yes. would get that push to go beyond blade servers into, into the rack and stack uh, right. market. So, uh, 10 so base T is not catching on fast enough is, uh, you we're, know. We're, we're, we're seeing signs of that now. In, uh, certainly, Romley was a very slow start, a very, very slow ramp. You know, now we're, we're moving into, you know, tail end of this year, um, Intel's refresh, uh, their, their Ivy Bridge cycle. And again, there, there's a lot of optimism on many of our parts that we're going to start to see much more deployment. Um, you know, something as simple as, as PCIe Gen 3 was very difficult with Romley. It was, you know, a new technology. Um, a lot of folks were, were on the edge from the standpoint of interoperating with, with you know, Intel servers and interoperating with each other. Um, Ivy Bridge is going to break that barrier and, and we're going to see wide scale deployment of, of uh, PCIe Gen 3 which overall brings the cost of connectivity, you know, the, the speed of connectivity up and the cost of it down. So we have high hopes to see that, that uh, penetration of 10 gig, uh, you know, really increase significantly. 10 g base T is a part of that. Yeah. There, there, are, there are certain mar market segments, some of the, the hyperscale environment doesn't have a, a huge need for 10 g base T because their cabling is top of rack. Um, they're, they're perfectly fine with you know, direct attached copper, the DAC twin axe cables. Uh, th there's other environments though that are more the traditional enterprise that are end of row and they haven't completely migrated over to a 10 gig switching ecosystem. And 10 GPST offers one thing that, that's really irrefutable from a value proposition and that's to allow each side to, to upgrade independently. 
And so we're, we're, we're starting to see more deployment of, of uh, 10G based T, um, more switch rollouts too. There's been switch rollouts from Dell, there's been switch rollouts from Cisco, you know, major switch players that now have you know, uh, very concentrated, high high port count, uh, 10G based D switches. Yeah, so, uh, you know, that's kind of the edge is, uh, you know, lagging a little bit on 10 gig. I think in the general switch market, you've got some that can do one or 10 uh, mm -hmm. gig, and even uh, Arista last week announced that triple speed, one, yes. uh, you know, uh, you know it, I'm sorry, 10, 10, 40, 100, I think. So, yeah. you know, where are we with that kind of general, uh, you know, cost dynamic of 10 gig, 40 gig, and 100 gig? I mean, the. The cost dynamics, and it, it's always hard for me to, to talk specifically because there's always cost and price. I'm privy to, to the cost because we make the components. I'm not privy to the, to the price because we don't sell it direct. It, it sells through other channels. But I can say that, is that there's been a huge downward pressure on the, the overall prices, um, on the overall costs. The, the prices, I think, you know, within the, the traditional OEM market, I, I think that there's been the tendency to keep a, a, a really broad, uh, gap between one gig and 10 gig pricing. Um, we're starting to see that come down and that's one of the reasons why I believe that, that uh, in the Ivy Bridge cycle we're going to start to see you know, significantly more uh, 10 gig adoption. On, on top of the need from a technology and speed standpoint, cost is going to drive that. 40 gig is really a, a function, if you look at just the cost, 40 gig is really the price of four 10 gig ports. Okay. So it's, it really is an MLD4, four, four, four lanes of 10 bonded. Um, the pricing is always a little bit different, but from a cost, that's what it is. Yeah. So, Greg, Greg uh, we're, we're about to wrap up. I want to give you the last mm -hmm. word, though. Uh, what's the coolest thing you saw at Interop? Oh, boy. Uh, you know, I, the, the hard part is... is Besides I, the Broadcom I, booth. Oh, that, well, <laughs> that, that, that's true. Thank you very much. Um, I think probably the, the coolest overall technology is, is really starting to put legs on some of the SDN capabilities. Um, you know, there, there's uh, been some companies that uh, are, are being very practical in that and, and actually demonstrating some of the, the chef and puppet capabilities of putting really eyes and ears into the network from a purely third party standpoint to be able to see failures as they arise, microbursts, other things that uh, are pretty exciting to have that level of visibility, not through one vendor, but through a very broad range of, of applications. I, I love that, putting eyes and ears on your puppet. So, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that's excellent. Well, Greg, uh, always great to deep dive uh, with you on the networking. Uh, this is Stu Miniman with uh, Dave Vellante, uh, talking with Broadcom here from the Interop and EMC World Shows in Las Vegas. Uh, always lots of great tech. Uh, great to catch up with you, Greg, and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. Uh, this is SiliconANGLE TV's live continuous coverage from EMC World 2013. We'll be right back with our next guest. <laughs>